So I take it the rest of you don't need jobs. There's a career fair and you're all stuck here. Apparently. It's only grad students. So I didn't know. Some undergrads said they have to go to career fair, so I should remember this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so unfair that some people get to go, some don't. But anyway, um, we will get started. Uh, so what I am going to do today is um, start off where we left off about um, game research. And the interesting thing is a whole bunch of ideas get connected up with game trees. In particular, something that you never thought would be connected, which is online computation. Which is, you are, are you going to do work during the time when you're also supposed to make a move? Versus, have you done all your thinking before and you just came to play without having to worry about thinking during the game? And uh, the min-max trees that we looked at, for example, they do essentially online computation, right? Because they look at, they decide what, they, what move they should make, they make the move, they let the opponent make their move, and then figure out what move they make, and they're thinking at that time, they're thinking in their head about the move that they're supposed to make. And this is online computation. While this is happening, the clock is ticking, right? Which is why, in fact, there are different kinds of chess. For example, lightning chess versus boring chess, or what you call, which is basically grandmaster chess, where it's the, the it, they have a lot of time to make their move, and there's a total amount of time for that they take for making all their moves is fixed. Okay. So one of the interesting things that online computation brings to bear is that there is only so much time. And in the total time, you have to decide how much to think, how much to act. OK? And it becomes quite hard in normal kinds of computations that you have seen up until now in computer science. Most of these computations essentially take forever, or take their own time, and when they terminate, they terminate. And that's when they give the answer. If you stop them in the middle, you get garbage. Do you see what I'm saying? On the other hand, so those kinds of computations are extremely hard to use while in an online fashion. Because they essentially take all the time, you don't know how much time they take, they take all of it, and if you happen to stop them a millisecond before they are done, you get garbage. Right? The advantage, so, so what you would like to do is something like an anytime computation. And any time computation is a computation that gives you an answer whenever you stop it. If you give it more time, it will give you a better answer. If you give it even more time, it will give it even better answer. Hopefully, the idea is that in fact what you really like to hope for is this is time, this is quality of solution. What you really like to have are things that go like that. Algorithms which, as you give them more time, they give more quality. Okay? You certainly don't want algorithms which sort of go down as more time is given. <laughs> right? And, but mostly what you typically wind up having is actually algorithms which are like this. <laughs> so they basically make um, Sort of, they stuck. They get stuck in some place, make a move. Get stuck in some place, make a move. Get stuck in some place, etc. 
The reason this is useful to think about is, remember at the end of last class, as we were leaving the class, towards the end of the class, we essentially pointed out, uh, we essentially pointed out, okay, that the pure min-max essentially wants you to go all the way down the tree until you find terminal nodes. For anything other than simple games, that tree would be way too large. That tree would be way too large. And in fact, you cannot actually, in fact, generate and you know, figure out your optimal move because of the size of the tree. So instead, what we did was we said we could do heuristic min-max. What's a heuristic min-max? That's limited depth min-max. And what limited depth min-max says is I just arbitrarily pick up a depth and only expand the tree up to that depth. Okay? Of course, I'm not expand. I, I will still expand it in the depth first search fashion. But whenever I have reached that depth, then I don't put more children in. Sort of like depth limited depth first search. Now we are doing depth limited min-max with depth first search. Right? You're doing this, and of course there are two questions that, that we were discussing at the last end of last class is now if I stop in arbitrary places, my game is not in a terminal state. I don't quite know what its value is. So I need additional piece of information called an evaluation function, which sort of takes the game position right now and tells me how good it is. Okay? And the terminal nodes actually know that real value, but everything else is a heuristic. Okay? And so these evaluation functions are going to be used. And I want to speak in a minute about the evaluation functions, but as I am saying this, I want to also connect it to this whole anytime notion of computation. The big question in these kinds of things is how am I supposed to put the depth for the depth limited search? How am I supposed to know where to start? Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what happened in the depth limited search too. Normal depth limited search, I can give you a K and I just happen to know that all the good solutions are above K, then you can just basically search depth limited and depth first search within that depth limited tree. Okay? However, in this particular case, um, I, so, so I want to use the same idea here. So the way we expanded the limited depth search to iterative deepening search is pick a depth and then pick another depth and then pick another depth and keep doing this. I can do this for min max. So depending on my approximate idea of how much time I have to make a move, let's say I will pick four plus as the depth. That means two times I get to make a move, two times the um, opponent makes a move. And this is the only thing I'm going to consider. At the end of four ply, I consider all the, all the nodes and consider their evaluations. Okay, evaluation function. Okay, now it may be that I got done very fast and I still don't have to make, um, you know, I don't have to actually make the move right now. <laughs> You know, so instead, what I can do at that point, I'll keep this move. I'll expand the depth to, let's say, six plus, and redo the whole search again, just like it did deepening depth first search. Okay, you'll get a new move this time. Now you keep this move, and if it's time, you take this move. If not, expand it to eight plus. I would argue this is a kind of an anytime computation. Right? Because you always have a move, you're just improving, quote unquote, the quality of move if I give you more time. I'm bringing this up because you have never thought of anytime computations in your life, probably, before coming to this class because you've been told an algorithm has a normal termination criterion and that's it. 
So I'm asking what happens to the algorithm when it hasn't yet terminated? What is its intermediate states like? And is it likely to actually improve monotonically on some property? In this particular case, I'm looking for the property of the quality of the move I'm making. Quality of the move I'm making, right? OK. So this brings up, so this connects the anytime stuff that I was just mentioning in the previous slide. And, and it's all online computation. I'm talking about anytime computation now, about how to increase the depth a little at a time. OK. Um, so it combines both of those, but brings up two additional questions. One, of course, something that we already started answering last class, which is where do you get these evaluation functions? And the other, you just took it for granted when I said the deeper the better. Why is it actually reasonable to say that if you go deeper in a search tree, it's still not terminal? It just you went instead of four ply, you went six ply. You said six ply, you went eight ply. Okay? And you did the uh, search in that case. Why is it actually the case? that you expect the quality to improve. Is this some sort of a fundamental property of nature that deeper is better? Or is there something else going on? Keep that in the back of your head. And let's talk a little about evaluation functions now. OK, so we talked about uh, this evaluation function, um, which is basically keep the, remember the structure of the evaluation function. All reasonable evaluation functions assume that if the state is a terminal state, you will recognize it. You should never play a game where you don't know if you won. It's like, you know, if you say, have I won? Have I won? Have I won? And you're asking your opponent, opponent will say, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Even when they have no pieces left and you have all the pieces left, they say, not yet, not yet, because I'm importing more pieces. Because you are a clueless guy and I would like to take a look. My point being that I assume at the minimum you will know a terminal state when you see one. If it comes and bites you, you say, hey, you're a terminal state. So all evaluation functions should be able to see if it is a terminal state, and if it is a win for max, give it plus infinity. Loss for max, give it minus infinity in this particular case. If it's a draw, give it a zero as the value. This is the minimum every evaluation function does. And if it's none of these, then it's a case where it's not a terminal state. Then you just do some you know, hand waving, which is in this particular case, you counted the number of rows, columns, diagonals that are open for max, minus number of rows, columns, diagonals that are open for min. Right? And that is a reasonable metric of how good the, uh, how good the, uh, the uh, board is for um, the max on the max point. Agreed. That's a, a possible evaluation function. And as I said, for other things like chess, there may be evaluation functions like this, uh, where you think in terms of features of the board that you think are connected to win-loss probabilities. And you sort of give some weights, and this happens to be some sort of a linear heuristic function. By this time, you sort of realize that evaluation functions are black art. That means you don't exactly know how to come up with evaluation functions. You sort of, it's sort of like heuristics, except it's not even like A star heuristics. In fact, one of the issues is, are the evaluation functions supposed to be admissible? What does admissibility mean? We don't talk about it at all. In fact, evaluation function is just sort of gives an approximation of how good the uh, board position is. That's it. OK, it's kind of nice that after spending all this time about admissibility in A star, we come to harder life, which is uh, this particular games research, and say anything goes. You know, in the end, if you win, it's like a good idea. If not, it's a bad idea. Yes. Uh, is there a reason as to why we use infinity and not just one and one? Well, again, the question is, I basically use infinity because the numbers should sort of make sense. If if I put one and minus one in the previous case, especially the number of rows, columns, diagonals open for max minus the fun for min can be greater than one. So that means this partial position is even better than win. 
which makes no sense. <laughs> right? That means people will start playing game. Right? That's why I put plus infinity minus infinity. So basically what the plus infinity minus infinity should be, the highest and the lowest values the game can ever take in the true terminal nodes. And you should make sure that evaluation function doesn't cross them. Because if it crosses them, it makes no sense. Right? That's the reason I put plus infinity minus infinity. It's a good question, and it's worthwhile thinking about those kinds of things. Right? OK, so this is blackout. This is actually the case which sort of brings us face to face with two kinds of research that was done in dealing with these kinds of games. OK? And if I'm right, let me just get back to, let me get back to this. Okay, this. So there are like two kinds of research that was done. In the older days, basically in like 1997, when Deep Blue won over Kasparov, the evaluation function was hand designed. Chess experts basically designed the evaluation function. They decided what are the good features. They also more or less decided what are the weights. There was not too much automated learning going on. Instead, they focused on search, doing search blindingly fast. And in fact, at that time, they had people, different people working on chess programs. Some people will try to improve their evaluation functions. Some people will try to just improve the raw speed of the search. And as it happened, the people who were improving the raw speed of the search wound up doing better in terms of beating the grandmasters. Do you see what I'm saying? And I mentioned this to you that when Deep Blue actually won, they came up with a, an application specific, ASIC, application specific integrated circuit, essentially, a VLSI chip whose only purpose is to spit out board positions. Remember, the cost of expanding the search tree is the child generation, always. So if I can generate children very fast, and just like now there may be an app for it, they had a chip for it. And that chip would just generate chess positions very fast. And you can't question success because they did beat, they did beat Casper, ending human dominance of chess once and for all. Right? OK. And of course, the interesting thing is that you could say, no, that's no fair. That's why this whole notion of unfair comes in, in addition to career unfair. Um, it's unfair because people don't do this kind of search. Kasparov can just whine, saying, I don't play chess like this. I have no chip. I do patterns, I look at the patterns and sort of figure out how to do well. That's what makes me Casper, that's what makes you a little machine. Interestingly, people argued these arguments. You know, one of the things I'll do when I go back is I will connect you to two New York Times op-eds by two Yale professors who could have talked to each other instead of writing the op-eds. <laughs> <laughs> that it's easier to talk through uh, New York Times. And one guy called David Gellertner, who you might remember, not that you remember anything, um, as the guy who was one of the computer scientists who got a letter from Una Bamber. Of course, you guys don't even know who Una Bamber is. Okay, look at all of this up, okay? This is like, in addition to here, you should learn some history. Uh, at least the most recent history. So anyway, Ted Kaczynski was sending these letters which would contain bombs. And it was also sent to intellectuals, and one of them was David Galatner. It wasn't quite clear whether David Galatner was an intellectual until he got the bomb. <laughs> but after he got the bomb, he became an intellectual, because, because only intellectuals are getting it, so it must have been the case that you're an intellectual. Right? So anyway, so what uh, if David Galatner wrote an op-ed saying, this is no AI. This is not the way intelligence works. Intelligence means something completely different. And Drew McDermott, who was actually an AI researcher, an amazingly smart guy, um, who actually retired now, uh, he basically wrote a rejoinder to, in the New York Times a couple of days later. And it's worth reading both of them. Because this whole issue of what is intelligence, 
is something that keeps dogging this particular field. After somebody wins over you, you say, sorry, that's not the right way of meeting. Okay. And so that would be an issue. Okay, so that was the way that was going on in 97 time frame. What's going on right now is more of the alpha go times. In fact, one way of understanding it now, you do a lot more offline computation learning the evaluation function. In fact, the evaluation functions were done <coughs> offline, even in the deep blue time. It was people who were sitting and trying out different different evaluation functions. Now we figured out basically approaches that can look at massive number of games and trying to evaluate how good an intermediate position is. In fact, I will give you, before we are done today, you will start getting an idea of how to do that. Okay? Um, and so in particular, if I give you a bad evaluation function and then you applied it to a node, but then you also went below it, applied it to its children, and then backpropagated using min-max, you now have two values for this node. One based on your heuristic, one based on this extra work that you did. To the extent going deeper is better, this backed up value is a better approximation to your true value than whatever evaluation function you came up with. I repeat this, but this is a very interesting idea. This is telling you how to convert computation into quality. How to convert computation into better valuation of interior nodes. And if they did this, let's say, if you don't understand anything else, understand this way uh, AlphaGo can be working, which is, it's basically doing this on a large scale for a large number of intermediate node configurations. And it's improving its valuation for those. Right? And then it's hashing them in a big hash table. Whenever this particular uh, board position comes, I have spent like last 1700 years. By the way, that's the amount of time AlphaGo would take if you make the mistake of running it on one of your computers instead of the deep blues servers. So for the last 1700 years, I had nothing else to do. I computed the interior node values. Now I'm just going to use them as the evaluation function and do min-max. In fact, instead of doing min-max, they did a slightly different idea, which also we might talk about, called Monte Carlo Research, MCT, which is a slight variation, you know, with close randomization. In. And that's how they won this time. And both of these are different ways of doing well in these games. And to some extent, it depends on what time do you have. If you have tons of time beforehand, you can learn the heuristic, learn the evaluation function. If you only have time after the game starts, this is the only thing you can do. And these can be complemented, they can be combined together. Making sense? Okay, so that's one part that I want you to understand. Um, so, the other thing, of course, is I want you to, I, I sort of said this in the background, but in, I want you to walk you down with this, which is basically the min-max cutoff, the deeper you go, and you basically put the evaluation values to the leaf nodes, and then you do min-max with alpha beta pruning. Remember, alpha beta pruning doesn't ask, where did you get your numbers? It just says, what's your number? And then uses those numbers to compute the bounds, to compute the bounds, to cut the search. Right? So it actually works irrespective of whether you went all the way down to the leaf node or you just went a couple of layers and applied some random valuation function. Okay. And one of the interesting things is if you don't, if you only have normal kind of evaluation functions, like the obvious things like number of pieces left on the board kind of evaluation functions, the biggest difference tends to be how deep were you able to go? So in particular, this was obviously written like, this particular slide was made about almost seven years back. So before AlphaGo. When they were thinking in terms of, more or less everybody has the same kind of evaluation function. What they will do differently is the search. Fast 
customers are slower in terms of the um, at the, the chip. Okay, so a four ply look ahead is a hopeless chess player. It's probably better than me, but hopeless chess player. Okay, a four ply um, basically is sort of a human novice player, essentially. An eight ply is a typical PC seven years back, are uh, a human master. So four to eight ply is already human master. Okay. 12 pi is deep blue and Casper. 12 pi, that means I look six of my moves and six of your moves. I'm talking grandmaster level now. Why? Because I'm looking at B is 35, that's in fact is 35 for chess approximately, power 12. 35 power 12 moves is what I'm looking at. That's the tree size. For Go, B is worse. Okay, so in fact, the point that they found was the deeper you went, you're doing better. And in fact, the real difference is between how far you can look ahead. So going deeper can also be seen in terms of looking ahead. The reason I say looking ahead is the following. Suppose you are the max. You have three moves. You have an evaluation function. Do you even have to care about doing any search? Just apply the evaluation function here and say which is the best move. This is essentially the one fly solution. It's as good as the evaluation function. You compare that to something which goes four ply, it's looking ahead more into the number of uh, looking ahead more into the number of nodes. Okay? In general, people have told you that the more you look ahead, the better you can plan. And that's sort of working out here. When you're looking ahead, you're looking into the contingencies and maybe you'll do better. Okay, my question actually is, by the way, keep this in mind. So this is essentially the way to think of online search. So you are here, you have three moves, so let's say, you evaluate all three moves and take the best move. That's it. That's the greediest online search. <coughs> if you have a little more time, you look a little more ahead and then decide what your move is. If you have a little more time, you look at more ahead and then decide what your move is. In saying all this, we are sort of saying that the more you look ahead, the better the quality of the move. Now, what actually do I mean by saying quality of the move is better? What exactly do I mean by that? Here is a way of thinking about it. The evaluation function gave these guys values. Let's say this is 4, this is 3, this is 4, this is 7. Evaluation function gave these values. If, in fact, you went all the way down to the terminal nodes and did true min-max, okay, let's say these are A, B, C, A, B, C, maybe this would have gotten the value A star, this would have gotten the value B star, this would have gotten the value C star. That's the true min-max values. When I'm talking about quality, I'm talking about how far are 3, 4, 7 vector from A star, B star, C star vector. If you got A star, B star, C star without doing all the work, then you are not going to do any worse than the guy who went all the way to the deep end. This is what we mean by quality. So it's all in terms of backed up values and how good are the backed up values um, as you go deeper versus your upfront well, you know, approximation. And in general, we are sort of assuming the deeper you go, the closer this vector would be, the vector that you get uh, when you go a little deeper, um, that might be instead of 347, it might be 298. You are assuming that 298 would be closer to A star, B star, C star. That's what I mean by saying deeper means better. So the question is, why is this true? Why is actually this true? It's easy thing to believe in, 
the more you look at, the better you do. But haven't you had situations in your life where you thought a little more longer and you actually wound up failing? It happens. So the real question is, these are two possible answers. Which is the right answer? So answer one says, taking mins and maxes of the evaluation function. Remember, if you're just going deeper and you're not going all the way to terminal node, you're using the same evaluation function, except at a lower level. So instead of saying number of rows, columns, diagonals open to max minus number of rows, columns, diagonals open to min, at the level one, I'm doing it at the level four. Why is this computation somehow telling me more about how good the node is when I'm doing it at level four than it did when I did the same computation at level one? These are the kinds of questions you have to ask yourself. Right? And so one idea might be that maybe taking the mins and maxes of the evaluation values at the leaf nodes improves their collective accuracy. Right? This is a kind of argument that makes sense. And somehow you're taking some numbers, the same old bad numbers, but somehow you're taking average, you know, mins and maxes, which is an aggregation of some kind, and that somehow improved their quality. That's one potential reason. A second idea, it turns out actually that this is a bozo reason. It's just not true. Okay? In fact, uh, in, cal in, in statistics, you know that if you want to estimate a quantity, estimate it directly. Don't estimate it by taking the pieces that comprise that quantity. Okay? And if you estimate it directly, your errors are likely to be less than if you aggregate. Because when you're doing aggregation, the errors build up. So in fact, this is a cardinal sin in statistics. And I put this here because this looks like a very reasonable thing. Many people would have thought this is a very reasonable reason why it's working. The actual reason it works is a different possibility, which is why going deeper, you might notice some obvious traps. Because of which the evaluation function, when backed up, becomes better. So the idea that I'm saying here is I went to this long search tree and I'm applying evaluation function here. But when I'm coming here, there are nodes here some of which I can see are definite losses for max. One of the most interesting things about human games is they may take a long time to win, but they take very little time to lose. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? You can lose chess in like a couple of moves, I don't know, like four or five moves. You start and there's a checkmate, and you say, I'm done. I'm slowly getting used to like three, four day game and I'm done. 